So, so I welcome everyone to our, our webinar today. And my name is Ashley Eel Gibbs. And let me just get my uh, share screen going here. Um, can everyone see my screen okay here? Okay, great. Um, one second. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, and you're still seeing my screen? Okay. Um, yeah, so welcome everyone. Welcome to session four of the Environmental Action Committee of West Marin's Point Reyes Birding and Nature Festival held virtually April 22nd through 25th. And happy Earth Day. It's a good day. Um, as I said, my name is Ashley. I'm the conservation director here at EAC. And I'm delighted to be your host, um, along with Patty, for today's program, Is the Monarch Migration Vanishing from the West? With Mia Monroe, Robert Pyle, and Cheryl Schultz. So before I introduce our speakers today, I want to first thank all of you for supporting EAC's mission to protect and sustain the unique lands, waters, and biodiversity of West Marin through your participation in our annual festival and through your generous tax-deductible deduct member contributions. We cannot do our vital advocacy work without you. Learn more about our mission, our current work, and our upcoming events at eacmarin.org. So as we navigate the festival online this year, here's a few things to remember, sort of logistics. So this is a webinar format, and you can, so as you can see the hosts and speakers, but we cannot hear or see you, but we know you're there. And we're hoping for some active participation in the chat. And, um, Yes, yeah, so you can use the chat to comment, to ask questions. You can upvote a question using the thumbs up icon if your question is similar. And if you're watching us live throughout the four-day conference, please note we built in break times for stretching, eating. Um, if you miss something and you've purchased a video pass, we will send you information on that in May and on how to access all the 24 webinars through the end of the year. If you haven't done so already, you can pick up um, your, our limited edition John Muir Laws, Owls of Point Reyes Festival Tees, Hoodies, Totes, and more online through the 30th. Um, I'm excited for my hoodie. And um, so just sharing my next slide here, um, we wanna thank our Friends of the Festival sponsors for helping us reach our $10,000 match contribution and remind our guests and sponsors that our virtual keynote meet and greets are every day from four to five with chances to win prizes. Um, so that's for sponsors, guides, and volunteers only, and that those will not be recorded, unlike this webinar, which is being recorded. So uh, lastly, please be patient with us and our speakers um, as technical difficulties may occur, even though we hope they won't. Um, so if, if even, you know, if loss of internet or anything like that happens, we'll try to get everything back on track. Um, worst case scenario, if the webinar should end, just close out and restart the webinar through Reg Fox. Um, one little reminder, uh, I know this went out today, but if you've started on, say, your phone, it's better to stay on your phone and not switch to your computer. Uh, switching of devices doesn't work um, too well. So um, let's see. And then I wanted to share this picture, um, which is of our board member, uh, Cynthia Lloyd, with Mia Monroe, who I'm going to introduce in a little bit. Um, so our staff and board are involved in EAC's Monarch's work and we released a report entitled, entitled Marin's Monarch Movement at the end of last year and that's available on our website. And um, this guide is comprehensive and helps you learn about the butterfly and what we can all do collectively in Marin County to help the population rebound. So, so again, you see Cynthia Lloyd, our board member here, um, encouraging uh, focusing on monarchs, and she's in the field with Mia Monroe, who I'm going to introduce shortly before I tell you just a little bit about our program. So often when we think of monarch butterflies, the eastern monarch butterfly comes to mind with its spring arrival to the U.S. and its iconic fall migration to the mountains of Mexico to overwinter. But in California, we're fo fortunate to host the western monarch butterfly. And in today's program, we'll explore that Western monarch butterfly and learn about some of the reasons that their population is unfortunately in a steep decline. So this shares the local perspective with Mia Monroe and some community science data. Dr. Cheryl Schultz will present her work uh, documenting the precipitous decline. And Dr. Robert Pyle will also share his work on the relationships of the Eastern and Western monarch. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, our three distinguished speakers. Mia Monroe 
is, um, let's see, I think I have a picture where you can see uh, Mia better here. And um, Mia is a National Park Service Ranger and volunteer and NPS uh, Marin Community Liaison in Marin. Her career started at Golden Gate National Recreation Area in 78 before she moved to Maria Woods National Monument in 82. She's introduced countless Bay Area residents and vis visitors to the wonders of the rich and unique natural ecosystem. She's a Zero Sea Society Thanksgiving Monarch Count volunteer and participates. We're lucky to have her participating on EAC's Monarch Working Group and on the One TAM Steering Committee. Dr. Robert um, Michael Pyle, who I think goes by Bob, um, founded the Zero Sea Society in 71. He is a biologist and the author of 25 books, including Chasing Monarchs, Migrating um, with the Pas uh, Butterflies of Passage, Butterflies of the Pacific Northwest. Um, I'll put a, a link in the chat in a little bit. Um, lots of books. And he lives in an old Swedish farmhouse in Graves, Grays River, Washington. And Dr. Cheryl Schultz is an associate professor at Washington State University. Um, I don't know, Cheryl, is that the, you'll have to tell me if that's the Wazoo one. I, I actually went to college in Washington. Um, I'm in Vancouver. I'm Vancouver. in the Vancouver campus. Oh, okay. I'm in Portland. I live oh, in Portland. That's, oh, that's great. So um, she's researching human caused uh, changes. Oh, I must have been thinking of Western Washington. Um, so she's researching human changes in the Earth's ecosystems and how they may be responsible for the decline and the extinction of the world's biological diversity. She studies the ecology of at-risk species in response to key drivers, habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, habitat degradation, invasive species, all these challenges we're facing. So um, that that's my intro. I don't want to take any more of our valuable time and I'm going to turn it over to Mia now. Thank you, Ashley and Patty and EAC for this invitation and especially the chance to talk in my home county. For me in Northern California, monarchs floating in daily, easy to find, has been a sign of the seasons turning, as Rachel Carson says, the reassuring cycles of nature. And for me, it is the trigger to start watching, to take the pose in that picture on your screen. As a young ranger, I was tapped to participate in a World Wildlife Fund grant to the Zertsy Society to inventory monarch overwintering sites up and down the coast. And this led to awareness already that the numbers were declining, sites were being lost, but I also got to witness significant efforts to protect monarch overwintering sites like the Terwilliger Grove in Marin County, the Elwood site in Santa Barbara. And also I was in on the ground floor of a formalized monitoring program called the Thanksgiving Count. And this came out of the awareness that that inventory brought together a lot of information about the overwintering sites and population and trends but since we were already noticing the decline, we wanted to start keeping track and that's monitoring. And so a group of us conferred and realized that we were heading into the field around Thanksgiving every year to count the monarchs at the overwintering sites. And there was just a small group of us going out and checking in on our favorite places. And we noticed this pattern. And now the Thanksgiving count is in its third decade it puts community scientists, volunteers out into the field who are trained, follow protocol, and now it's all again under the oversight of the Xertsy Society. So what this means is that, oh, for me, watching is an expanded occupation, a volunteer commitment to the Xertsy Society where I go and check in on all those volunteers we go through training programs, field visits, we learn the protocol, which includes how to count, how to find the monarchs, how to do the data sheets, et cetera. And does it surprise you, the cadre of volunteers grows each year, the chance to be in the field, the chance to observe a wonder of nature, a chance to contribute to science is really compelling for many, many people. So thank you, Ashley. Is that's my graph slide that's up there now, right? Um, let's see. As, yeah, here's the graph slide. Okay, great. 
So this graph is from the Xerxes Society um, website, and there is so much information there. And this is from the westernmonarchcount.org page, takes you right to the data to see uh, what us community scientists are up to. And at first you might say, oh, that blue line, what are they talking about crises? But that blue line there is us community science volunteers, more and more of us each year, more volunteers going out to more sites. But the data that we collect contributes to this graph that shows the precipitous decline. As I mentioned, for decades, we've noticed fewer and fewer monarchs returning to the overwintering sites, and then a very sharp decline the last few years, so that you can barely even see the two bars on the right. Now, what's happened over the nearly three decades of the Thanksgiving count is we've added new goals to put this cadre of volunteers to work, but also to contribute to our overall knowledge. There's the Thanksgiving count that's roughly at the end of November and beginning of December, because that's when we think the peak of the overwintering population is at the overwintering sites. They've migrated. Mind you, we're talking about wild monarchs that have migrated to the coast to cluster and overwinter for months. And we think that they've made it to the coast, they've begun clustering, they haven't been through the ravages of winter. So the Thanksgiving count is a quantification of the, the maximum population of the overwintering phenomena. Um, now, we realized that we could, with this cadre of volunteers, do a lot more. So five years ago, we added the New Year's count. And this documents the population that will be the breeding population in late winter, early spring. They've arrived, they've made it through the ravages of winter. Usually it's less than half have made it, but it's the New Year's count. So we have a new project. But what's exciting about this group of volunteers is that they are eager to get out. So we're constantly adding new monitoring goals. Now we go out to document the arrival in the coastal area, the onset of clustering, the Thanksgiving count. We go and check after storms to see how the sites are holding and protecting them. We do the New Year's count. We also do the um, onset of mating and spring dispersal. Because one of the important things that have happened in the last few years, and this is um, outlined in the Xerxes Society's call to action, is there's many, many data gaps. There's much that we don't know. And so by having us out there, we can contribute at the overwintering sites through our trained volunteers. And Cheryl's gonna talk about some other efforts. And one thing that's happened in the last few years is we've tried to shift um, our volunteers to the various INAP platforms so all this data can be talking and contributing and sharing. But you might be wondering, what happens to all this data? And that's the value of having these community scientists trained and supported by the Xerxes Society because there's the protocol, the audits, and the data management so that it can turn around and create graphs like the one that's on the screen now that shows population trends, it can be fed to media, and of course it's available to scientists. And because the Xerxes Society coordinates this, there's the um, veracity, there's the, the scientific backing so that it is meaningful, which is of course the goal of the community scientists to, to come up with things that's worthwhile and usable. Now, an exciting thing has happened in that the more we are all out there thinking, we're also, learning what we don't know. And this year, of course, um, there were very few monarchs at the overwintering sites, but at the same time, people all over were reporting monarchs in their gardens. So we also are in the thick of what is happening out in the West here now. But also what's exciting is when you're in nature, when you have contact with wonderful things, you want to take action to help. And right now we have the next generation of people who are stepping up to say, what can we do? 
and I'm part of the Environmental Action Committee's Monarch Marin Movement, which has involved so many different stakeholders from master gardeners to the agricultural community, restorationists, school teachers, in efforts in Marin County to take action and to educate. I'm also part of the RCD, the Resource Conservation Districts, which is way, the way the state of California is funneling money to actually help people with pollinator gardens or land managers um, take better care of their overwintering sites. And real significantly in my professional life as a national park ranger, I'm part of a collaborative with the other land managers in Marin County called One Tam. And we just received a sizable grant to help land managers come up with um, habitat assessments, restoration plans, and actually money to get some of the restoration and enhancement work done. And then in Marin, we not only have the overwintering sites at the coast, but inland we have the wild milkweed meadows and there's money there to help the land managers um, manage and enhance and expand the wild um, meadows of milkweed. So this is a very, very exciting time. We're of course all really holding our breath. We're asking what we can do, but some tools are being brought to the table um, kind of in this next generation of activists. In closing, however, I would like to um, also comment on something that I have found very profoundly moving. And I was very excited when I attended the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, webinar in December when they announced um, what they were gonna do in terms of the Endangered Species Act protection. But the first thing they talked about was the huge groundswell of love and action that people undertake for monarch butterflies throughout the whole continent. And I, of course, see that every day. Everyone wants to help. And I want to acknowledge um, Cheryl in her most recent article in the News of the Lepidopter Society for concluding with just how critical the role that we can all take in our gardens, in our public lands, and in our schoolyards, and what a difference these actions everywhere really can make. Um, and I just want to let all of you know who are listening, there's something that everybody can do. Um, Ashley's going to put up the link to the Xerxes call to action. And I want you to know that us community scientists will be out there watching, watching for the monarchs to return. Thank you. I'm going to stop screen sharing and uh, put some of those links in. Let's see. And um, Cheryl. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I want to thank uh, the EAC group and Ashley for uh, inviting me to talk with you today. And I am Cheryl Schultz. I'm at Washington State University. I am on our Vancouver campus. So I live in Portland and I do most of my work in Oregon and Washington. But recently, in the last five years or so, have expanded that work to working across the West and working with Western monarchs. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about this conservation, what we think of as a conservation conundrum of what's going on with uh, Western monarchs. So to start with, I'd like to start with acknowledgements because this is not just my work. This is really the work of many, many, many people, many organizations trying to put the puzzle pieces together to figure out both why monarchs are declining, what's happened, and how we can help the population recover. Um, I want to call out Elizabeth Crone, really all of the work that I'm going to talk about today is a collaboration with Elizabeth and many people that we've worked across. This probably is just the beginning of the people I should put in the acknowledgements. I also want to thank Mia and the Xerxes and Xerxes Society and the Thanksgiving Camp volunteers. Really, all of this work would not be possible with all, all of the community engaged and really putting together the data sets that really provide the background and the backbone to really start to understand what is maybe happening with this population of migratory monarchs. So a couple things I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to talk about in very quick succession the past, the crash, and the future. The past being before 2017, what happened when this population crashed, and maybe where we can go from here. 
Um, so as Mia just talked about, uh, and this is really where I came into starting with Western Monarchs, um, Xerxes Society was had this, basically this graph that they showed me and said, we know something's going on, but we're having trouble putting the pieces together. When the uh, official count started in 1997, over a million monarchs had been counted on the, in the coastal overwintering sites. Over time, in the following decades, we can see that the population has gone down in terms of the numbers in the overwintering sites, but the number of sites that we're counting keeps going up. But because different sites get counted in each year and it's not the same sites all the time, it's not as easy to figure out kind of what these data mean. We knew that when the count started, a couple things. One is there had been counts before that that didn't all of a sudden appear as a overwintering count in 1997. And we did have some data that went back before that. And we knew that the reason many of these counts started was because people kept saying there are fewer monarchs. We keep seeing fewer monarchs, something's going on. So with that and with Elizabeth, we did an analysis, which in ecology we call population viability analysis. And that allows us to project how many monarchs we think there were in the past. Now, because there are fewer counts, fewer numbers of observations in terms of people going out and doing counts, we have wider what we call confidence intervals, but we knew there were millions of monarchs back into the 1980s. This is on a log axis, so this is about 10 million, about 1 million, and about 100,000. And so by the time we published this paper about this dramatic decline in monarch butterflies, we know the populations went from mm, overwintering numbers from around 3 to 10 million overwintering monarchs to estimated in a couple hundred thousand. So big confidence intervals, but an enormous decline in these in the overwintering numbers from the 1980s to around 2016 when we did this analysis. Not going forward. Uh, hang on. I don't want to. My slides aren't going forward, so hang on. There we go. Okay, so one question we had when we published this is, is this really this estimate in the, um, with these Y confidence thermals, was this really happening? I love these pictures from the uh, 1980s. This is Dick Simpson uh, and a group in, I think, San Luis, uh, looking up at the grove at Pismo Beach where they uh, had called the route from Morro Bay to Atascadero, the butterfly route. And they, in the 1980s, had this rough estimate of around 5 million monarchs in coastal California in December of 89, which is right about what we were estimating. So this made us feel like our model estimates were probably pretty on target. We weren't, one of the things about that though was we were on target with that, but one of the points of our paper was we saw that there was this enormous risk of extinction in terms of the way we model it, this enormous risk that the population was going to crash to very low numbers in the next couple of decades. Now that's only a model. Um, we didn't necessarily expect to see that in the immediate future. Before I go on to sort of the crash, one other piece I wanted to offer here is a lot of conversation about what's causing this enormous drop in monarchs. Questions about was it climate change? Is it pesticides and habitat loss, so loss of the milkweed habitats or loss of the uh, overwintering sites? Could we identify a single factor that might be really driving this loss of monarchs? And the analysis, I'm not gonna spend too long on it today. It looks at the combination of these different factors. And what it says is we see a strong association with these numbers with loss of coastal land. So the development of the coastal land is highly associated with these numbers because we're developing the sites, those overwintering sites that are getting uh, counted. Um, we also see a, an enormous increase in glyphosate and neonicotinoids. So the pesticides that are used in the breeding habitats as well as in urban areas. There's a lot of use through these pesticides in our urban gardens and golf courses in urban areas, as well as in the agricultural areas. And we also see a signal of uh, climate change, although frankly, it's not as strong as the other signals. Um, but the key thing here is that there was no smoking gun. So all of these factors likely contribute, but we can't point to 
uh, finger to a single factor saying this is exactly what's going on. There's one thing driving it, but the combination of all of these factors contributes to the decline in monarchs. Okay, so that was 2017. Like I said, there was this enormous risk that we predicted this probability of the population declining so low that that migratory population might not recover. It was a model. We did not expect to see within two years of publishing this paper that that was really going to happen. So we had predicted there was like an 85% whoops, whoops, 85% chance that the population would drop below 30,000 butterflies in the next 25 years. We did not expect to see that in two years. So this, of course, has been enormous cause for alarm. Many of you are probably familiar with hearing about and seeing about concerns about the crash in the overwintering populations. And then this has continued. So that was that initial crash was in 2019 or 2018, Thanksgiving of 2018, then 2019. And here we are today where the population and the overwintering sites, those counts in the overwintering sites, dropped to below 2,000 butterflies. So that's what Mia just talked about. But the backdrop to this is all of you in California, not me, who's up here in Oregon and Washington, uh, are seeing monarchs every day. We keep hearing reports that monarchs are being seen in the, your yards, in your gardens, as you walk the streets. And so the question has been kind of what's going on with monarchs in the West? And, you know, it's really isn't that monarchs as a species in the West are going extinct because there's lots and lots of monarchs that people are seeing every day. There's just few monarchs in the overwintering sites. So one piece of figuring this out is Elizabeth Crone, who I mentioned and has done all this work to me, actually got stuck in California during COVID. So she was in Davis, COVID came and she stayed in Davis. Uh, and so actually she got to back to Boston just last week. <laughs> She's finally vaccinated and able to travel. But while she did it on her like quote unquote vacation in Davis, um, is she started doing weekly surveys in the areas around the coast and they came up with routes with, she had some students that were in the area as well. Um, and so they started doing weekly surveys and walking the streets and the places they could get to from the sidewalk, taking pictures of all the tropical milkweeds, the caterpillars and the monarchs that we were seeing and then extrapolating from the number of urban streets in Northern California, so uh, North of Los Angeles, to uh, the area, how many urban monarchs might there be in gardens this year? So with that, they came up with this back of the envelope estimate of about 12,000 monarchs in the urban gardens this year. So that's like six times the number that we counted in the urban and the overwintering sites. Um, this is of course just a back of the envelope estimate, but it gives us some kind of order of magnitude of how many monarchs might there be in the urban areas north of um, the north of Los Angeles, because we know there have been resident monarchs in Los Angeles and San Diego for several decades now. So the question then is kind of what does that mean? Is there potential for resilience? Could the monarchs be going to the urban areas? Are they going to stay urban and stay resident? Are they going to repopulate the West? Is this migration going to continue? With the back of the envelope kinds of population models we do, we predict or we can understand there might be on the order of several, probably 200 million monarchs in the breeding areas, probably in the 80s. If you looked at breeding areas in the 80s, what that population might have been. So we're paling in comparison to orders of magnitude of monarchs that might have been in the West before the population crash. So even if we have monarchs in the urban areas, it's nothing like the population sizes we probably used to see when they were breeding across the West. So a lot of questions about this plant here, this is tropical milkweed, and how has that potentially contributed to the buildup of monarchs in these urban areas? There's a lot of questions here. Many of the things are, we're just starting to learn about. So these are pieces that we are just at the cusp of trying to figure out these puzzles. This is tropical milkweed, Asclepias carosavica. This is a map of its distribution pre-1980. You can see here in California, there was very little tropical milkweed pre-1980. Um, this is a map of tropical milkweed 
from 1981 to 2021, so the next three decades. And you can see the tropical milkweed has just expanded across the continent, so not just in the West, but an enormous expansion of tropical milkweed into these areas. Now, one of the things about tropical milkweed and monarchs is that tropical milkweed, unlike our native, most of our native milkweed, does not drop its leaves during the winter. It means it's a year-round resource in climates that can maintain reproduction. And one of the problems with tropical milkweed in the, is in that keeping its reproductive, keeping its leaves green all year, is monarchs have a tendency to then reproduce all year. And when they reproduce all year, uh, the parasite that is associated with monarchs can also persist all year. So I'm not going to take the time to go through the life cycle of the parasite, which most people call for short OE, is Ophrocystis electrochera, but it associates with monarch butterflies and can only persist in places, uh, or it only persists through the parts of the life cycle when the milkweeds are there all year. And then so in the areas where the milkweeds drop its leaves, the OE populations drop down and it sort of builds up over the summer. Where there's residents, there's a continuous supply of leaves that the OE builds up on. We know from work that Dara Satterfield did in California a couple um, back, I guess about a decade ago now, it was published in 2015, that there's much more heavily infected population of milkweeds or the, the monarchs that are milkweeds that are resident have much higher infection rates than those that are not. So she looked at year round breeding versus the overwintering sites, as well as some of the seasonal breeding. And the, it's the resident populations that are heavily infected with OE. So what does this mean in terms of uh, monarchs in the West right now? Is tropical milkweed good or bad? And I have to say to me right now, I think we really don't know. Um, we have a hypothesis that monarchs may be able to persist in urban gardens, but because there might be so much OE building up, it might mean they don't have the demographic capacity to expand in land. This is a hypothesis. We don't know that, but this is a working hypothesis that's a concern for us because even if there's 12,000 in the urban gardens, that pales in comparison to the populations that would have persisted across the West with a full migratory population. I'm gonna do a 30 second story within a story because I can't not do this. Um, I mostly have spent most of my career not working on monarchs, working on a little blue butterfly in Oregon that lives in prairies, which look, well, it almost looks like the one behind me. I'm not in a prairie right now. That's Willow Creek Natural Area in Oregon. That's camas blooming in early spring. The butterfly I work with most is uh, Fender's blue butterfly. It lives on a host plant, which means it eats not milkweeds, but Kincaid's lupin. Fender's blue and uh, Kincaid's lupin were added to the endangered species list in 2000. When I started working on them, they were uh, highly at risk. There were a few thousand of them only in Oregon. So this is about 1500 butterflies or so in Eugene, Salem and just south of Portland. Today, these populations are rebounding. We've had decades of work now on the science. What do we need to know? to understand their dispersal, their population biology, their habitat, how to restore their habitat. We've done lots of work with property owners, with agencies, with lots of people coming together. Their populations now number in the 15,000 or 30,000 across the range. And any time now, probably in the next few weeks, we're getting ready to downlist them from endangered to threatened. So this is an incredible success story for a butterfly in an era when we keep hearing about insect declines to think we can actually do it. And it gives me hope that we can do something similar with monarchs, that we can recover these monarchs, meaning recover the migratory population. So what do we do about it? This is what Mia alluded to, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of that, but just to say again, even if there's lots of questions in the science, there are concrete things that we know we can do. We need to protect the overwintering sites. We can't have an overwintering population if they have no place to spend the winter. We also know we can get rid of the pesticides in our yards and gardens and natural areas, especially the neonicotinoids, which are killing the insects. We also know that we can convert our lawns and gardens to pollinator-friendly gardens. 
to getting rid of many big green spaces and probably not. I know that turf is maybe drought resistant, but it's not very good for pollinators. Um, we also can really focus on planting native milkweeds in the early season. We're trying to figure out right now, one of the pieces of projects we're working on is what's going on in the early spring. How do we get monarchs through that early spring period? What's key to that recovery? Um, there's a project in my lab right now, which we call the Western Monarch Mystery Mitt Challenge. And we're trying to get people like all of you engaged by saying, if you see monarchs, please take a picture, let us know. We want to know where they are, when they are, and what they're doing. Um, we've run this in early spring the past couple of years. We're about to run a bonus week because we want to see just one more week of what's going on in early spring where are the monarchs going when they leave the coast. We kind of frame this question when they were literally all in the overwintering sites. Now those overwintering sites are many coastal areas that are urban gardens as well, that we want to know are they going to start leaving those urban gardens and heading inland to start to migrate. Um, you can take a picture, you can send it to us directly, you can report it to iNaturalist or the Western uh, Monarch Milkweed Backer. This week, our current one that I think is going to be the farthest from the coast is out here in Death Valley. Lots of questions about where that monarch might have come from. We know there was a monarch that somebody took a picture of. It's in Death Valley. Um, and so did it come from the California coast or California garden? Did it come from somewhere south of there? We know there's a monarch there. Will that help the migration continue? And the last thing I'm going to leave you with here is we've also been working on putting together educational materials. They're available on our website uh, in English and Spanish and one just for kids. So this is connects you into the challenge project, some instructions on using iNaturalist, some activities for kids, and hopefully um, enjoyed by folks here. I will leave it at that. Cheryl, let's see. Perfect. So I think I'm up. Yes. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Mia. Uh, thank you, uh, Ashley and Patty, for hosting us. Thank you to the festival and to the Marin organization for putting the whole thing on for caring so much. And to everyone, happy Earth Day today. Happy Earth Day. Good thing we're doing for Earth Day. I'm happy that uh, Cheryl and Mia were as positive as they were because I'm afraid I'm gonna be the big bad Jeremiah today. Um, although I'll try to leave you not without a shred of hope. Let me share my screen. Why isn't it doing it? Uh, let's see. Uh... Just click share screen and then it should give you an option of what screen you want to show. It does and I click it and nothing happens. Oh, well. Maybe try one more time. There we are. There we are. Have you got it? Yes. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I've been lucky to be involved in monarch conservation, mostly lucky, uh, sometimes heartbroken, sometimes stupid with joy in the process of it for 45 years, uh, ever since the uh, overwintering clusters in Mexico were first uh, generally discerned by the scientific community. They'd been known, of course, by the local people, uh, the Tarascan Indians and others, but they weren't known to science either uh, Northern or, or uh, Latin American prior to that time, which is quite remarkable. One of the greatest natural history discoveries of the 20th century. And that was in 75 and in 76, as chairman of the Lepidoptera Specialist Group for the International Union for Conservation of Nature, I put forward the monarch, uh, North American monarch migratory uh, phenomena, both the Californian and the continental, uh, as the top priority in world butterfly conservation. And they were adopted as such by the World Wildlife Fund and IUCN in 1976. So 45 years, uh, we've been working on the conservation of this butterfly and in some areas even prior to that. Now in 1983, 
Well, the arrow doesn't work. What works to advance my slides? Let's see, I see your cursor. Um, the arrow is not working. Can you click next slide or something perhaps? Thanks for bearing with us, everyone. Of course, I'm not seeing a next slide thing. Um, when I tried it before, the uh, arrow worked. Maybe remote control. No, that's not it. I see your cursor there. Uh, uh, wow. Maybe try the space bar. There we How go. Oh, Thank that you. was it. Thank you. Good thinking. <laughs> so it's been known for uh, well over 200 years that the North American monarchs gather in great numbers in the fall and split and go somewhere. But it wasn't until 75 that the destination for most of the North American monarchs were known. We really, in spite of uh, people's beliefs that the West Coast phenomenon is ancient, it might or might not be. We have almost no information prior to the 1890s. There's no information that I'm aware of uh, legitimate in the uh, Spanish um, period of occupancy of California, which of course is almost 600 years now. There's not a single mention of the monarch migration. And there are lots of other natural history ones. So that is surprising. And it is possible that the Californian wintering phenomenon on the, in the coastal foggy forests might be a relatively recent phenomenon. Steinbeck wrote about it, the Beach Boys sang about it, and it is one of the most beloved phenomena uh, in North American natural history, but that might not be as old as has been generally thought. Uh, but we've been seeing these, having this real concern about it. So not only did we name it the top priority in the world conservation for butterflies in 76, but in 1970, in 1983 and four, when my colleagues and I wrote and published the Invertebrate Red Data Book, the first account of endangered invertebrates in the world, uh, trying to get a sample from many different phyla. We did data pages for both the Californian and continental monarchs, but we had to come up with a new category of threatened species for the red data process for IUCN. And therefore we put forth the concept that Lincoln Brower and I developed independently, but virtually simultaneously, called the endangered or the threatened phenomenon because the species is not at risk. The phenomenon is, or the phenomena of the Eastern and Western migratory monarchs are definitely endangered. That was approved, that was published in 1984. So we've known for a long time that these phenomena uh, were at risk. Of course, everybody's familiar with the massive clusters in Mexico, uh, sometimes reaching almost this kind of density in, in California in prior years, but this is a, a classic OML fir cluster in, in Mexico in the transvolcanic ranges which are still there at perhaps 10% uh, at most of their historical numbers for which we have data. So they've declined radically too, but not as radically uh, by a whole order of magnitude as the Californian ones have. And the other place where we've been familiar for years of them overwintering is in the Monterey Pines and Cypresses and in recent decades, well, recent for a hundred years or more, probably mostly in the introduced eucalyptus trees, which prevents, presents all sorts of interesting enigmas for native species lovers and monarch lovers. They get pretty skitzy over this issue from time to time. And here we see a great historian of Western monarchs, the first person who really gave us a good picture of the history of the California uh, occupation by monarchs, John Lane, uh, with a group of people at Natural Bridges State Park with the monarchs clustering in some thousands, possibly tens of thousands at uh, Natural Bridges State Park. Uh, it was only the adaptive shift of monarchs to overwinter in eucalyptus that gave them the possibility for persisting in the numbers that we've known in the 80s and 90s. It's entirely possible, some think, and I'm among them, that we might not even be here talking about Western monarchs today uh, if it were not for the uh, adaptive shift that monarchs made to overwintering in eucalyptus, because that's been the stopover plant uh, toward a future day when we may have coastal forests once again dominated by native trees. That's a long time from now. So the model for a very, very long time was this uh, called the Berlin Wall, Berlin Wall model of all the monarchs east of the Rockies migrating to Mexico, the monarchs born west of the Rockies migrating to the California coast. This was unquestioned basically. In books, articles, film strips, scientific papers, 
But this is even Lincoln Brower, the great monarch scientist paper. This is what it was thought to be uh, for a very, very long time. This was incorrect. Um, these were the only data that we actually have at that time that that was based on in the West. And uh, many of those are fallacious data because they were based on transferred monarchs, which cannot tell you what the naturally originating monarchs of a given area will do. It's simply not a logical extension or possibility. And so I investigated what the actual data were available on non-transferred tagged recoveries back in the early 90s. And this was all there was. The only non-transferred tag recoveries were from Boise, from two school teachers who reared and released with their students a great many monarchs. Some of them were recovered in different spots on the California coast, but others, which were not mentioned in most of the publications, were in fact recovered in pointing southeast in uh, Utah. And yet from those data sprang this image, which is laughable. When you look at this, you think there's a great body of data supporting the Berlin Wall model, but, but in fact, there was not. It was simply a matter of hearsay and repetition of assumptions that were not based on reality. And so I began to ask, is it really logical for the monarchs west of the Rockies to migrate all the way across the uh, basins and ranges to the west coast, uh, lots of obstacles of drought and so on and so forth, or does it make more sense in the slide on the right for them to get into the water courses, and I know that monarchs follow water courses a lot, uh, and on down to perhaps even join the Mexican migration. This was heretical at the time, and I had no adherence to my hypothesis at all. Uh, so I decided to go try to follow them and see what they were doing. If you want to know how I did that and what I did, you may read my book, Chasing Monarchs, Migrating with the Butterflies of Passage. It looks different now in paperback from Yale University Press. It was quite a field trip. Um, one of the great field trips of my life, and I tagged all the monarchs I could on the way in the old style of tagging, occasionally being able to split a broken costa for a monarch with the tag, allowing it to continue migrating, whereas it would not have been able to before. So that was fun. And I followed the monarchs uh, by visually and found them wherever I could, tried to recover tags, didn't on the way, but I did manage to follow their basic uh, migratory movement. Fortunately, there were enough monarchs in the Northwest in 1998 when I did this uh, for it to work. And I did have one recovery of a monarch I tagged along the way from um, near Santa Cruz. And this was the very first monarch from Washington or Oregon to be recovered in California. So we did know that yes, the assumption that Northwest monarchs go to Mexico, go to California was certainly true for some monarchs. We did know that but it didn't say for all monarchs. And in fact, what I found in the field, to my surprise, was this, that the majority of the monarchs that I was finding and following, finding and following, finding and following, and then measuring uh, their vanishing bearings were heading south and southeast rather than coastally. And this is how this was expressed uh, to see the data literally no one expected that Western monarchs would be going southeast and largely south with a modest movement west. Now, I was in the interior Northwest. If I'd been doing this in Southwest Oregon or even in uh, uh, farther west in Washington and Oregon, uh, we would have had larger vectors uh, toward the coast, I'm sure. But this suggested that perhaps the old model was incorrect and that a new model had to be developed whereby some Western monarchs, in fact, join the California migration, uh, the Mexico, pardon me, the continental migration uh, to Mexico. And in fact, um, on a day in October, I did witness, I'll forget about the arrows for a moment, I did witness about where the monarch with the question mark under it is, uh, I did witness uh, monarchs west of the continental divide uh, approaching the uh, border within a mile. And then my colleagues the following year actually watched border crossings very near there, near uh, Oregon Pipes National Park. Uh, subsequently, there's been a lot of work done in Arizona. And now we know there's significant movement across the border between Arizona and California and Arizona and North and uh, Arizona and Mexico. We don't know how many, we still have no tag recoveries in the Mexican, 
in the Mexican colonies. But it seems logical to think now that the interior Northwest uh, does possess a, a Mexican origin migratory component. And in my view, that may be all that's going to remain uh, in a few years. Oh, sorry to interrupt. We are getting a bit short on time. I know uh, I'm about to wrap it up. Okay, perfect. I didn't have uh, my full 20 minutes. Uh, the, um, this is the model that Xerxes is promulgating now, showing movement in both ways. And the important thing about this is we now know that the Eastern and Western migrations are linked, which was never appreciated before. That means we have to consider them as an entire system, not piecemeal. And this becomes terribly important in the end because we know the monarchs are dependent upon milkweed, the native species like the showy and the narrow-leaved, and in my view, those are the only species that anybody should be planting uh, north of uh, Texas and Southern California. And then in this oldest picture of all of American monarchs, uh, Kramer's picture from the 1700s, tropical milkweed. And I feel very strongly that people planting a great deal of tropical milkweed has lured the monarchs to remain through the winter. And uh, Elizabeth's work has shown that now this winter. And we're so lucky to have great scientists like Cheryl, whose work on the Fender's Blue has been nothing short of stunning and it's recovered. St. Cheryl, I call her. And uh, David James and uh, Orly Taylor working on these butterflies. But David James just published a paper in which he suggests hope that these butterflies will become, as he saw them do in Australia, resident, yes, in the lowlands, but also maintaining a migration. Uh, uh, Chip Taylor, on the other hand, the director of Monarch Watch, in unpublished data, he has a model he's developing where he has now very little uh, hope that their, the migration will recover uh, on the coast and that the overwintering colonies will persist because of global warming and changes in offshore uh, seawater temperatures, uh, the drought cycles, and the basic lack of any further ecological incentive for the monarch to carry out that migration. And I fear that I find Chip Taylor's data more compelling. We will not lose the monarch. We will continue to have it. It might still be in those groves. It will still be on children's faces and in our gardens. But I fear that this will soon be another garden butterfly in the Bay Area, like the Gulf fritillary, and to some degree, the, the, uh, the uh, blue swallowtail. Um, I hope I'm wrong. And the one ray of hope is that it did crash in 1995 as well. Brower and I published a paper suggesting that the recovery in 96, spectacularly so in 97, may have been due to refreshment from the Mexican immigration. So let's hope that happens. Let's hope Cheryl's stunning work uh, proves all of this wrong and that, and that uh, Chip and I are old fogies who are uh, not nearly hopeful enough. But I fear we may be witnessing the functional extinction of the phenomenon that we listed as endangered 45 years ago. That would be microevolution in a very short period of time, two or three years. Very exciting from a biologist standpoint, but a sad loss for all of us. We will still have our monarchs to celebrate. Roger Tory Peterson himself said, Bob, the monarchs will take care of themselves. In one way or another, they will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's see, are you able to? Nora, oh, there was a question. Nora said something was transferred and then a question mark, please explain. Monarchs which were transferred by two or three, um, Professor Fred Urker to carried out all the early tagging for many, many years in the, deserves great credit for the ultimate resolution of the migratory picture, engaged with uh, some other people, including a prominent monarch uh, a worker, to transfer some monarchs to British Columbia, to elsewhere in the West, and to see where they went, which was an interesting exercise. But it's not an experiment because there were no controls. And uh, I maintain that a monarch taken from A to B and recovered in C does not show what a monarch that started out in B will go to C. You can't show what naturally moving monarchs will do by transferring monarchs. So those data to me are interesting, but very questionable for proving anything. Great. Um, and I, think I strongly urge people, sorry, not to transfer monarchs and by no means uh, go along with the release of monarchs at weddings or any other commercial release of monarchs away from their point of origin, because it totally screws up everything we're trying to do in understanding their natural movements. Well, that's great. 
Somebody else asked questions. Were there certain species of, well, they, actually somebody put it in the chat about the different milkweeds. So maybe you don't need to elaborate on that. So thank you for that, Mia, putting that in. Somebody had asked about all the um, different milkweed species. So she's answered that. And I think we're set. There was a question that I think, Bob, you already answered in the chat. So I think we're good to go. That was I all. I think Mia had something to add. Didn't Go ahead, Mia. So I wanted to amplify what Bob was saying about releases because what we encountered this year was people raising butterflies in their gardens all winter, but they were worried that when the monarchs eclosed came out of the chrysalis, let's say in December or January, that they wouldn't be able to make the flight to the coast on their own, which was probably a well-founded concern. So they would drive sometimes 50 or 100 monarchs to an overwintering site, which um, of course meant that they weren't wild. They didn't make the migratory journey and it completely discombobulated our counts. Um, and there was possibly the spread of disease as well. So that was a very, very troubling, good-hearted but troubling phenomena this year. Yes, and when the numbers that we're working with are so very, very few, every single monarch counts in the count. So those releases become statistically very significant. Do I have time for one more comment? Um, yeah, I, I think we can, um, we should just maybe two more, one or two more minutes, maybe one more comment. I know you were gonna add maybe some of the things people can do um, to get involved on their own or whatever you would like to add, please go ahead. One thing is to become acquainted with INAT. Um, I'm not a techie myself, but INAT is an amazing tool and it has allowed us to locate small clusters where we might not have known them or to document the early emerging milkweed. Um, it's what other um, important data collection systems are based on. So um, if all of you are interested in stepping up and doing things, that's one way to become a community scientist is to become familiar with INAT and document um, your observations and contribute to the data pool there. Um, I just wanna underscore, maybe Cheryl wants to go over her points um, of how important it is to have a pest pesticide-free environment, plant natives, plant native milkweed. At EAC, we say do the right action in the right place. So I was just going to say, so the projects, the Western Modern Mystery Challenge and the educational projects that go with that have information on iNaturals, which is a fabulous platform to be putting information on your observations, whether they're adults, whether they're caterpillars, other butterflies that you're seeing, other milkweeds that you're seeing. Um, the data also directly go into the Xerxes database, which is the, well, it's not just Xerxes, but Xerxes and others, the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. Um, and so if you go into those educational projects, you can see how to connect to those because those observations will help us understand. We started those looking at the wintering populations and early spring breeding, but those observations will help us understand what monarchs are doing throughout their life cycle and throughout the annual season. So certainly we are uh, ever interested in folks recording those. Um, David James also has some work this year looking at directly, are the monarchs in the urban areas going to migrate? And he started tagging some areas, I think around Santa Clara County, doing some tagging work to try to see if they tag them locally will we start to pick them up in the spring migration this year? Yeah, David's a colleague of Cheryl's at Washington State University. He's done a lot of wonderful work uh, tagging in Eastern Washington that had to be terminated and using uh, penitentiary inmates to work with him on that. But they had to terminate that this year because there were no monarchs recorded in Washington this year. One or two sightings that weren't even certain. So I think, uh, yeah, we, we may have lost it as a Northwest butterfly. You will uh, have a new Hold picture that. of it. I yeah. hope not. I hope not to. Gosh, That's I what I wanted not. to say. I hope not. 
we do we do have to wrap up but i want to thank all of our speakers and thanks for bearing with us um for a few technical uh challenges and i know it was a little rushed we were so lucky to have three wonderful speakers today so and please um check out our other uh events coming up this weekend and since we do have to end on time um, we're going to wrap it up but thank you everyone so much this was a great presentation thank you thank you, thank you all it was wonderful very enlightening.